And, uh, we welcome today Justina, Dr. Justina Ray of the, Conservation, the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, she's their president and has been um, since it was incorporated here in Canada in 2004. Uh, in addition to overseeing the operations of WCS Canada, Justina is involved in research and policy activities associated with land use planning and large mammal conservation uh, in northern um, Canadian landscapes. She has been appointed to numerous government advisory panels uh, related to uh, policy development for species at, species at risk and land use planning in Ontario and Canada as an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Forestry and Trent University Biology Department. She told me that just before we started that she did her PhD um, in Central Africa uh, as well. So with that, uh, delighted to have Justina come and give us a presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, can, I hope everyone can hear me. Oh boy, that smells good. Okay, well, um, a little bit of a switch. Uh, we're going to be talking with this provocative title that I tried to muster uh, to, to sort of present a challenge to uh, you. And I'm not going to take a poll, but I imagine quite a, quite a number of you are, we have a certain uh, feeling about what wolverines are and, and their reputation. I'm going to try and walk through that today, what, what some of the reasons are behind this, but also bringing in uh, direct research that I've been uh, uh, fortunate to undertake in Ontario, combined with overall advancement in knowledge on wolverines over the last decade in particular, to sort of uh, kind of look at that myth a little bit more closely and see what we end up at the, at the end. Um, and I want to just say before, before I start that uh, I'm going to be showing quite a number of photographs. We're lucky to be seeing them. They're not all mine. In fact, probably most of them are not mine. So just uh, give that, uh, I've been lucky enough to have them shared with me. And, and so I just want to make sure that you all know that at the, at the outset. About 12 years ago when I started research on Wolverine and I had a small child in the house, I received this in the mail. And uh, this about sums up uh, the whole sort of attitude that prevails about Wolverine. And if you look closely at some of the verbiage, and I'm not sure how much you can see, but there are words like, just all this packed up into one little postcard, vicious, victim, deadly weapons, fiercest, nightmare, bone crushing. So if this is uh, kind of sums up uh, what, what, what has been the, the main feeling about Wolverine. But you know, this is not entirely baseless. Uh, Anybody who spent any time out on the land in the north, um, indigenous peoples, trappers, et cetera, for, for many, many centuries, know quite well um, that wolverines are formidable beasts in the north. And in fact, anybody who has a cabin or, or engages in trapping um, have, uh, has experienced this firsthand. And in, we were lucky enough to have a number of these trappers or, or explorers uh, quite prolific in their language uh, describe to uh, us exactly what this is all about. One such uh, great quote, several signs tell the trapper that the marauder is the kakajou or wolverine, curious, fearless, gluttonous, wary, and suspicious, the mischief maker and the freebooter and the criminal of the animal world. And then, and then and goes on to say one of the, um, that uh, out of the fullness of his wrath, one trapper gave a perfect description of the wolverine. He didn't object, he said, to being outrun by the wolf, but to be outwitted by a little beast the size of a pig with the snout of a fox, the claws of a bear, the fur of a porcupine's quill was more than he could stand. And the great explorer Stephenson had a, a, a similarly eloquent um, quote that I brought out, the wolverine is universally execrated throughout the north as an inveterate and tireless cash robber. The pestiferous brute also has a penchant for logging, uh, lugging away and hiding artifacts, which he has no apparent use for. I wish we could use that kind of language in our scientific publications these days. It's, it does describe the situation. And I've been privy, and I, as I will talk about it a little bit, to some wonderful first-hand reports of audacious acts of thievery and, and uh, being able to get through logs, you know, chew through logs like this to get into the trapper's cabin. And in fact, in the olden years, there were, uh, this caused issues. I mean, you know, trappers were dependent on their caches of food in the trap, in the cabins, and it wasn't too 
um, uh, rare on occasion where they would come upon the, um, upon the cabin to find all of their cash gone and because of the Wolverine. So these, this, this reputation does have a basis. Um, and so you know, when we get things like the Wolverine comic and Hugh Jackman, et cetera, well, maybe they went off a little bit too crazy on, on this tangent. But you know, there's always a little bit of truth to these, these kind of rumors. But let's, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. What is, what is a Wolverine? Well, Wolverine is not much bigger than a medium-sized dog. Uh, the males are about 30 to 40 percent bigger than the females, but you know they weigh typically between 11 and 18 kilograms, and 18 kilograms is fairly big. Think about your dog, how big it is, and compare it. Um, and the females about six to 12 kilograms, and uh, so they're but they're stocky and muscular and uh, sort of the the uh, quite you know big for their outsize. And you know they, they, they have different coloration. You know it's not consistent uh, according to their geography, um, but they can look somewhat different depending on where they are. Their closest relatives are, are weasels, marten, fisher, otter, badgers. They're a member of the, the weasel family, um, and one of the largest members of this of this family. Uh, but this is these are kind of this is who they look like, and and who they're most rel related to. And their distribution across the globe is, is uh, across the sort of boreal and arctic realm. And, uh, and they really are, have been more or less in that distribution, probably as, as, as far as we know, recorded. Um, and you know, they are not only a resident of North America, but also Eurasia, um, including uh, Fenescandia. Now, this animal is built uh, so strongly and stocky, muscular, and they're built for winter. Um, they, they do not hibernate. They take full advantage of, uh, I mean, they're fully adapted to all of the harshness that winter can provide and has provided. They actually seem to thrive in that situation. And their anatomy is all sort of reflects that. Uh, they have a very thick coat, which is kind of oily, actually. And that act it is actually frost resistant, and in fact, um, is one of the reasons where why Wolverine tr uh, trim is often found on parkas. I mean, I mean, um, mostly historically, um, and that's because uh, the, the fur doesn't freeze, and so that's sort of a good thing for anybody wearing such a coat. Um, and it uh, the feet are kind of like snowshoes; they 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 hang out above the ground. You can see how large they are there, sort of like lynx. They have a keen sense of smell; they can smell quite deep into the snow, um, and uh, just overall uh, really built for this, this kind of uh, situation. And if you want to look at their skull, um, you can see also further adaptations. They have extremely strong jaws that are well supported by muscles. Their teeth are unbreakable. Uh, they can crush any carcass, bone, um, and in fact, they do make a living as scavengers quite a bit um, and can take advantage. Uh, but they also uh, cache their food. They hide it in, under snow, in which case, you know, sometimes they have to dig through ice. They dig through beaver houses in the winter and such. Uh, all the stories that I've heard of people who have firsthand knowledge of living with wolverines on the land uh, inevitably talk about the incredible strength and ability to be able to uh, both both uh, cut through ice, but also be able to chew bones and such. Um, and these are their claws. They're not quite what the Wolverine Marvel character has has made, but you can sort of see that where they got it from. That's a bit of bone in in the middle. And uh, again, uh, you know, they use those for digging, for um, for being able to uh, handle uh, their food. And, and such things. So this is just altogether a really well-built animal for the kind of harsh environments in which they dwell. So in North America, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a, a slide that I'll come back to a couple of times to explain different parts of it. But if you see the sort of gray purplish, that's the central aspect of their range. And most of it is in Canada. It does go into Alaska. Because it's made of Canadian Geographic, it's sort of very focused on, on uh, the Canada component. And uh, there is some sense that uh, it was historically much more broadly distributed, particularly in the East, but we'll go, back, go into that a bit later. The Quebec and Labrador, they were there at one point. Um, that is absolutely certain. But uh, they, the last specimen 
or the live specimen was, was confirmed in Labrador in the 1950s and in Quebec in the 1970s. But overall, this distribution has been fairly strong for the last uh, 50 years or so, and they go down into the Rockies in the States. And if you look at this, it's not quite so uh, broadly distributed. If you, this is an analysis that was done just looking at the Western states. Um, and it's mostly a, an analysis looking at uh, potential habitat. And you can see that it more or less aligns up with mont mountainous areas in the southern part of the range and singles out some places that, if you had seen previously, are historical. So for example, in Oregon and in California, although we can't see all of it, um, there is still this kind of uh, modeled habitat in these, in these ranges, but it's rather fragmented. And really the only place that we really know about wolverines uh, to be in a stronghold in the states is in Idaho and, and Montana these days, although they have been found elsewhere. In Europe, they're similarly very uh, restricted to uh, <coughs> remote and, and often mountainous locations in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Um, and no sign of them anywhere on the, on the European continent, although they were historically. So what kind of place they live in? Here's a little bit of a panorama. Um, the Scandinavia, off the mountains, uh, the plains, the high elevation areas. British Columbia looks fairly similar in the Rockies all throughout, up into the Western Rockies, into, the, into Yukon. Um, Central Idaho also. The further south they are, the more dependent they are on these mountainous habitats. Montana, same thing. But then uh, there's also vast areas of North America which are not mountainous where wolverines dwell. And these are in the far north, uh, Alaska, so where you get just more tundra environments uh, where wolverines make their living. Um, northwestern Alaska gets even less mountainous. Um, and then the Northwest Territories out now tundra, uh, where wolverines can live, uh, live in surprisingly high densities. And not only that, but there's an entire boreal forest, lowland boreal forest that stretches east of the Rockies, in which wolverine dwell, in which no, not, not much was known until recently. Studies have been done in northern Alberta, which show wolverine to be fairly common in these lowland boreal forests, which have been subjected, actually, to quite a bit of industrial development. Uh, relatively speaking, and all the way into Ontario, where we did our study starting 12 years ago. And so these are, this is really a, a good uh, notion about where Wolverine are. Uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is because most of the studies and most of the, most of the uh, uh, detailed studies and his, historical knowledge of Wolverine have been really tied to mountainous areas. There's a sense and a bit of a bias uh, from a scientific understanding that relates to um, places where they live, which are really tied to mountains. But that is only a small part of their geography. Um, and these uh, larger tundra and boreal environments are just as important. And they have a different ecology. And that's partly what we're looking at today. So if we look at that broader uh, North American distribution, what explains, uh, generally speaking, uh, where they live and where they don't? Well, on the one hand, the wolverine distribution and uh, you know, that, that's more of uh, the, the Quebec portion is sometimes it appears in maps because people are still hoping they're there and, and sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, that's going to be explaining right now when you see it and when you don't. And we can go into that a little bit more later. But there are significant similarities between the distribution of wolverines and human settlement. This uh, map to the right is sort of a depiction of human settlement where the red is where most humans' uh, uh, populations are, are concentrated. It's, it's as we mo mostly would intuitively think. You can see some fragments of green going into the uh, lower 48. That often uh, coincides with mountains. And then, of course, the, the broader north, and that's the green, is where you have way less human direct human influence. Um, and that ties fairly similarly to wolverine distribution. But that isn't uh, the end of the story by any stretch. And in fact, it gets um, interesting when you look at factors like permanent snow cover, uh, persistent snow cover in the spring. So wolverines, as I will show you, really rely on that persistent snow cover, not only for caching their food during certain times of year, but also for raising their kits. And if they don't, uh, aren't successful in raising their kits, obviously they're not going to contribute to the population. So kit raising months and survival 
of these animals is absolutely critical. And this is a map with the, with the blue, the darker blue showing uh, where, the, where the spring um, snow cover into April and May is most persistent, and, in, and even into June, which is when uh, the Wolverine mums need, need protection for their, for their kits. And so that's an ongoing hypothesis as well, that that might be very tied to the broader distribution, geographic distribution of this animal at these scales. Um, and uh, certainly there is some definite correspondence between that map and Wolverine distribution. So let's look at that snow just a bit more. I mean, this is a huge aspect of life, particularly for Denny. And you know, what might look like a ceaseless snow cover to us actually has lots of activity underneath. This is one photo of a, of a wolverine den. I, I don't remember exactly where. But that masks a huge amount of activity going on underneath. Um, and so, for example, avalanche shoots, uh, rocky outcrops, other areas. The, when the, uh, this, this is the, the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of the den, but when you've got the snow cover above, those are very warm and cozy and absolutely critical for all kinds of wildlife, but wolverine with their larger size, et cetera, really do rely on these areas and rely on them to be covered for a period of time. And uh, wolverines are, um, uh, you know, they're not total, very re resilient from a reproductive standpoint. It's not easy for wolverines if their populations have been knocked back to make it up, make up for it in sheer productivity. So the average age of the first litter is three and a half years. For, a, a, for an animal that doesn't live much longer than 12 years, that's actually fairly late. Uh, lots of other mammals begin reproducing at a year. So you, and they don't reproduce every year. It's exhausting to have children, for heaven's sakes. And so they, uh, they actually have to skip a year, and, then, um, and, and uh, sometimes two years. And, and then they'll have two or three kids at a time, but they don't always survive. And these, uh, the, the females, if you can see in the top right corner there, they're having to move their kits quite regularly. They've got rendezvous sites and den sites, and they're always trying to keep ahead of the game because uh, they're, they're, there's, there's lots of uh, concerns out there, uh, particularly for other predators like wolves and bears to do find them. And we've, we've found that ourselves for the animals that we've radio collared. So, um, their resilience is not so significant, and that's very important from a conservation standpoint to keep in mind. Other aspects that are amazing about wolverines is the large distances that they travel. And this picture here of a, one of my colleagues from Alaska says it all. I mean, these, these animals, when you put radio collars on them and actually see how far they move and how much territory they use, it's quite significant. An adult male, a typical one, will probably have about a thousand square kilometer home range. For an animal this size, it's extraordinary. Some bears don't even roam that far. And adult females will have a bit smaller, maybe 300 square kilometers. And then it's the sub-adult males, the, you know, the ones that just got kicked out of the house, essentially, and are trying to find a place to be. Those are the troublemakers. We know that from, from, the, from grizzly bears and, and black bears, and they tend to really travel. And there's an amazing story that I'll tell you in a second, but, but, but the importance of the size of the range is, and the movements that these animals undertake is very, very critical, given, given that these are solitary animals that go very far distances. And if you're talking to any um, uh, indigenous knowledge holder, this is one of the first things that they will say about how these animals and their experience are always moving. And they're always moving long distances. One of the best examples of that is a colleague of mine who radio collared an animal in Yellowstone Park in uh, 2008, it's up at the top left. Um, and uh, in one journey, uh, it made a trek <clears throat> of uh, over 800 kilometers in 42 days. It wound up all the way down in Colorado where it hung out, hung out for quite some time. But there aren't really any wolverines in Colorado, so what it was doing there was unclear. It, it did. It did live for three years, and then they lost track of it. And then the next thing they know, this animal showed up in North Dakota. In 2016, the first such animal ever seen in North Dakota, of course, it was killed at that moment. Um, uh, the, the farmer was a little bit concerned about this thing showing up close to its animals, 
Uh, and, uh, and this is the journey of one individual. So it gives you an, an idea about what these animals are capable of. Um, and, uh, and we've only had the luck, we, the, the broader community of researchers, have only had the luck to get a small window into it, which you can only do, really, if you uh, put radio colors on these animals, which is not an easy thing to do, to track them or to follow them for that for too long. Um, so the movements of this animal are, are significant and are amazing. Back to this, uh, this uh, distribution map, I want to give a talk a little bit about this, this brown color here, which is a historical distribution. And this is something that has been, uh, you know, has most people, you see the maps of the historical distribution because there are records of Wolverine further south in the Northeast. Um, but you never know what those are, particularly in light of those, the movements of these animals. You don't know whether those are stray animals that showed up uh, someplace by accident, and then all of a sudden the distribution becomes much larger because they're just based, based on uh, putting a po sort of a polygon around uh, you know, uh, long distance uh, occurrences. You don't know really the extent to which that was ever a stronghold for Wilbury, even historically. And the record isn't very good on that. Uh, but we do know that uh, there was a great records of you know, large uh, acts of, um, uh, what, what should we call it, uh, uh, killing. Uh, from of, of large mammals that were that were recorded in, in, in quite large numbers uh, back in the 1700s and the, in the 1600s, and uh, Ernest Thompson Seton, for example, in, in his Lives of Game Animals, which is a very famous book, talked about this one circle drive, which is was a well documented means of hunting animals, and in one particular area, which wasn't really documented how big it was, where people would encircle a large area with nets and, and guns and such and then kill everything on site. This was the take, which for anybody living today is hard to believe. That you can imagine that there were that many wolves and panthers, but in there is mention of 12 gluttons, which is you know, a, an affectionate name for wolverines. And, um, and you, know, uh, you know, some of that's believable and, and some of it is a little crazy. So this is the kind of information that we have to uh, live on, live by, um, and to see what the historical picture was for these animals, and it's really hard to say. So all that is to, to say that uh, today's distribution hasn't changed an enormous amount, um, and we don't know the extent to which these animals really were as prolific as some of the historical distribution maps might suggest. Um, and that's, that's useful to know. But today, they are classified as species at, ri uh, species at risk in Canada and in, in Ontario. In Canada, it's a special concern designation, which is the lowest possible, but it is still considered a, a species at risk. And that's because of concerns at the southern edge of their distribution, <coughs> um, um, higher mortality, some over-harvesting in certain areas, concerns about climate change and such. In Ontario, they're actually considered threatened and that's on the basis of the population size that is surmised to be here in Ontario. So, um, so they are considered a species at risk, and therefore, and that combined with their uh, low resilient lifestyle and the number of threats that they are exposed to in terms of an uncertain future are reasons why they are considered that way. So enter our study in Ontario, uh, taking place in, in, a, in a place just like this, which we've got vast, uh, expanses of lowland forest in the very far north of this province doesn't look like typical uh, wolverine habitat as we have known it in the past, but in fact, it is. Um, and this is uh, just in the middle of the expanse of boreal forest that blankets the central part of Canada. But the most amazing thing about it is that this large area of about 500,000 square kilometers, which presently just has one permanent road in it in the far north of this province, is um, an extraordinary laboratory to sort of see how some of these animals um, use this in their natural conditions. And so that was what we set out to do uh, in the study. Um, and wolverine were an example of an animal that had um, experienced some uh, challenges in the southern part of the province, and very little was known at that time. 
If we look and zone in on the far north, this red line is the northern limit of commercial forestry right now, where uh, the legal limit, essentially. And the north is called the far north, and it is populated by about uh, 25 or so uh, remote First Nations communities that are only uh, accessible by logging road. Um, and the total population, human population of this area is about 15 to 20,000, something of that nature. And uh, these, this area is up for grabs at the moment. There's lots of interest in uh, mineral development and such, even forestry moving up northward. And so there's a great deal of impetus for understanding uh, a bit about these animals, like wolverine, vulnerable animals that we need to understand a bit more about. The different colors, by the way, between the east uh, in the west, that's boreal shield country, and in the east is this large expanse of wetland habitat. Uh, it's the second largest intact uh, land, um, wetland in the world, and actually contains enormous peat reserves, uh, so a store for carbon. That's just something to tuck away, uh, but it, it becomes somewhat relevant in the story as we, as we move on. So what did we know about uh, wolverines in Ontario? Well, not a heck of a lot. Now, right around 2001, uh, there had been a collection, these are all trap lines, where um, uh, fur auction, you could get from fur auction houses an understanding of which trap lines had caught wolverines. So these are mostly from northern communities who caught wolverines and then would sell them to the fur auction. And that was really the only information that the province had about wolverines being in the province. There was no um, there was no studies that had gone on. Um, there was no an idea whether wolverines were actually reproductively active in the province. I mean, was there even a breeding population? Or are they just sort of coming in from Manitoba? Uh, really unclear, just that the, uh, every once in a while, everywhere, anywhere between four and 10 wolverines were trapped every year. But that's not entirely surprising because even this was the moose map at the time. Moose are all over the province. But the line stopped right around the far north. It was blank up there. And that's not because they're not there. It's because there was really no knowledge, um, uh, not, no attention being paid to that, that far north. And so that's, that was the state of the knowledge at that point. Um, and wolverines had experienced, um, so we had a rough idea that they used to be, there were occurrences of wolverine in the 1800s. But remember what I said about these distribution maps that who knows the extent to which they were actually very uh, pop, uh, popular, how much they were in these areas. But there were definitely observations then. In the 1880s, it seemed like uh, it was, uh, they had started to, to move their range in the, to the north. And by about 1955, we knew they were as far east as Moussigny, um, but, uh, but not much further than that. And then in 1990, the distribution appeared to be really uh, focused on northwestern Ontario. And that was roughly the situation, which wasn't really very much information at all, just a kind of a nice fancy map. Um, and so we set out to conduct this study, and we did it sort of in three parts to it. If you look at this red line, um, and, and uh, we essentially did aerial surveys of this entire area, which is about uh, 550,000 square kilometers. We had in the yellow area, which is about 66, uh, uh, 60,000 square kilometers, we had an intensive study doing radio telemetry and, uh, and uh, other kinds of methods for just determining what the density of wolverines was in that particular area. And then where the stars were, these were areas where we, uh, communities where we went and uh, visited community members, people who had actually had full uh, firsthand experience with this animal to learn about them, about wolverines, to learn get, get as much uh, indigenous knowledge as possible, but also to understand the cultural relationship between trappers and, and wolverines. And so that was the how we kind of attacked this study. So we did this with various methodology. I mean, this is the kind of traps we had to build in order to get this wolverine. We had to, we had to, we had to uh, check these at least once a day, because yes, they do chew through those. And one of my colleagues in BC who led a Wolverine study had one uh, individual who we affectionately called Chainsaw Charlie because he got out of, an, of a trap like this twice. They did finally get him, but you know those myths do have a basis. So this is the kind of thing that we had to, uh, there's no Wolverine trap that you can sort of uh, order online. 
you have to you have to create these uh, in the bush. Um, and we also the, there's we also had to design a radio collar because wolverines don't have a really good neck. And so we had to design a radio collar, which is now much more standard, uh, that, was, that, that was able to uh, be worn with, with, with uh, relative comfort. And those, that was also at the beginning of satellite transmission, which was really terrific for, because of these long distance movements of the animals so that they could speak to a satellite. We could, we could get the movements from the comfort of our own home rather than trying to find them. Uh, in, in, in these large landscapes. And so we caught a number of wolverines uh, using this uh, setup and, and followed them as well. Um, and we also invested significantly in work, what I call non-invasive survey techniques, which uh, combine camera trapping, hair snagging, which where you get uh, the, the hair that allows you to then uh, uh, do DNA analysis and actually figure out how many individuals there are. Again, uh, going up to communities to conduct interviews and aerial surveys. And so these are, are methods for kind of checking out what's going on with wolverines and studying them without actually having to touch them and to apply equipment to them, which is uh, for both larger scale inquiries and also just from, for longer and longer term as well is obviously much more um, uh, preferable, but of course, some questions, like the movements, you will never know unless you uh, radio call them. And speaking of which, I'm only giving you a little bit of a taste because there just simply isn't enough time. But this gives you an idea about some of the home ranges, which are those polygons. Yes, uh, we did actually have very cool names for these animals, but for the purposes of our dispassionate science talk, they are MO2 and FO3, et cetera. So those are obviously males and females. And if you can see, the males had these larger home ranges uh, in which the females were situated. The males, by and large, avoided the road network. We trapped throughout all of this area because we had to uh, you know, check the traps every 24 hours on uh, snow machine, et cetera. So you, you, know, you have to do it in a road network. The interesting thing is that any animal that we did get, by and large, avoided the road network, with the exception of a couple of these females who, in fact, were harvested uh, through, uh, were trapped, <clears throat> um, and not the males. And so this relationship with roads was important. This just gives you a couple of examples of how particular animals would situate their home ranges sort of within uh, and outside the road network. Um, and if you look at some of the females, uh, this particular one, F2 and F1, both of them succumbed to, uh, they were both rather young females, and both of them were trapped within several months of being um, by, by uh, trappers in the area. And that's because there was just more activity um, and access through those, uh, those mostly logging roads, is what you see in the red. Um, so that was uh, important uh, for us to understand, and particularly the relationship to Deming. This is one female who successfully raised a litter uh, during the time that we had a radio collar on her. You can see this is a lot of activity, forestry activity down here. And her den, um, I don't have a pointer, maybe I do, but I'll probably mess something up if I use it. But um, if you can see sort of a very yellow, in, in the middle, uh, way up there, I should have practiced, sorry about that. <clears throat> you know what, today it's okay. It's a, so it's just in the middle up there, but the point is, is that it was about seven kilometers from any ro logging road, five kilometers from any kind of forestry, and actually situated really uh, pretty far away. Um, and this is a, a feature and a sort of a practice that is pretty well known for these animals who really have to avoid. And there are anecdotal reports of even people skiing past a wolverine den and the wolverine mum picking up the kits right away and taking them somewhere else. So very sensitive to this kind of disturbance. And this was the kind of den that we were looking at. So, you know, very difficult to point out. Uh, I mean, you cannot necessarily predict. I mean, these are not necessarily limiting features on the landscape. But this was where it had hidden its kits. And this is how it looks like in winter, if you can see right in the middle there. Um, not necessarily so clear about how rocky and rich it is underneath, but covered by snow. And that was where this wolverine uh, chose to, to den uh, for, that, for that particular time. There are just some questions and, and probably many questions that we cannot answer 
on the ground with these animals, as you could probably see by now, given the remote nature of their habitat, the uh, extensive movements that they undertake, and so many mysteries about their existence. And at this point, we really didn't know very much about their distribution. We only knew it from tra tracking records. So it was, was important for us to undertake a fairly extensive set of surveys over a long uh, area, over, over this large area. And to do so, we actually brought in pilots from Alaska in uh, planes called Super Cub planes, which are extraordinary planes, uh, and they are extraordinary pilots. This combination of the plane and pilot is actually not known from anywhere else but in Alaska, for the most part. You've got people, these pilots, who have uh, done extensive aerial surveys over, over uh, 40, 50 years of their career, and, uh, and actually our trappers themselves know the tracks extremely well. Plus, you've got the airplanes that can take you just right over about, uh, just not more than 100 feet off the ground, um, very slow flying, and able to maneuver very quickly so that if you see a track or anything suspicious, you can turn on a dime. Well, I can't. I'm sitting in the back, and there's that's two seats there, the pilot and the person in the back. There's really hardly any heating in this plane, and you're up for eight hours at a time. Um, and, and this plane can allow you to do that, you're, uh, it, uh, it's, which is both a blessing and a curse, as you can imagine. But this, we would take this plane, it was worthwhile to actually contract these pilots from Alaska and have them ferry themselves over from Alaska. It was preferable to employing whatever we had in Ontario, both because that accommodation wasn't there. And the Ontario government uses planes that are much better suited for fighting fires than for, for, for Wolverine surveys. You have to be in a position where you can turn and be able to identify tracks and none of the planes, like um, for those of you who are familiar, so Turbo Beavers um, and, uh, and Twin Otters are able to do that. By the time they're turning around, that track is long gone. Uh, you can't find it again, and, that's, and that's, uh, that's really difficult. So this is what we used for um, all the way between 2003 and 2012. So we could, did aerial surveys across this entire area. And sometimes we were lucky enough to see this, but very rarely. So this is a Wolverine that just, you just come upon, all uh, out there entirely by itself. Um, but what an extraordinary uh, treat to be able to see that. More often, you see the tracks. Uh, but, it's, but it's amazing that once you get um, a search image, once you develop a search image for these tracks, you can actually find them fairly readily. Um, and, uh, and really understand and get a feeling about places where wolverines are relatively abundant versus where they're not, and also where they're absent, that where you can have some confidence in that. We use these uh, survey techniques, and we actually went to Labrador in 2005 at the invitation of the Labrador government, also with our Alaskan planes. So they were actually went from Alaska to Labrador, and uh, that was the most boring survey I've ever done. Um, for Wolverines because there were none, and we were quite clear, having had that experience uh, uh, ranging from the, you know, the set of observers, and we had two planes and pilots, uh, we knew pretty clearly that, uh, that, that Wolverine were not in that landscape, even though we scoured it, because we had such a good frame of reference from the densities of Wolverines that range from Alaska to, to, uh, to, um, to Ontario. So, with this wealth of data of 10 years, it all boils down to this map, uh, which actually has a lot of interesting statistics behind it, which I won't bore you with at this time. But it's essentially looking at, in this 10-year in this time frame, where are the strongholds of Wolverine in the province, which is the red, to where they're really not uh, present, which is the blue. And then in between, you've got pockets of activity. And it looks like they are sort of slowly expanding their range a little bit to the east again. Um, and that's corroborated by some trapper reports as well. Uh, but this gives us a really good notion about where Wolverine are presently in the province so that we can use that as a basis for monitoring in the future. Um, and so that has been an important output, but it, it took hours and days and months of uh, field work sit and sitting in, the, in those planes, um, uh, pretty cold too. One story I just, I'll take two minutes to tell you is about this, this individual that we came upon in our surveys in Northern Ontario. 
And this is not a usual thing. I mean, this, this shot was taken from the plane. And it'll further horrify you to know that it was taken by the pilot of the plane while flying the plane. <laughs> and yes, he's an amazing photographer, but he was flying at the time and we were circling. The amazing thing about this is not that, but the fact that this animal stood like this. And we circled around him 20 times. And the reason it was so amazing was because we were watching. We had come upon this, and we saw all the tracks before him. And it was just littered with, with wolverine tracks. What the heck is going on here? But it was just one animal. And he was sitting right beside a moose carcass. And he did not budge. And in all the years of survey, I've never seen a wolverine not budge, particularly when we're circling 15 times or 20, over his head like this. Look at that. That was what he looked like, and he did not budge. And he stayed there by that moose carcass. Um, there were no wolf tracks near that moose carcass, and it hadn't snowed for at least five days. So we don't know where that moose came from. It wasn't a, it wasn't a wolf kill. Perhaps it was an ill moose. But, wolf, but wolverines are known to take down an animal as large as a moose. Hence, the myth is, has some basis. But this was one of my most amazing moments I have been lucky enough to have in my life. And it, using these survey techniques are so interesting and important at the large scale, but also at the small scale when we're trying to figure out what are the factors that limit wolverine distribution to the south. And again, it comes back to this road network. If we see um, we, this, this, I wanted to remind you guys about this sort of 60,000 square kilometer study area uh, where we did quite a bit of uh, more uh, very intensive surveys. And it was in a, a landscape that up near Red Lake, and that's Woodland Caribou Park, for, any, for those of you who know, um, where there's quite a bit of, about half of it is quite riddled with logging roads and, 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 and uh, uh, forestry, whereas the other half is, is relatively intact, or quite intact. It was interesting to look at the patterns of wolverine observations during that time where we saw tracks, again, from a broader scale, fairly studiously outside that road network, and that's not unlike caribou, which we also recorded at the same time. Fewer caribou, but also very tied to bog habitats outside of that road, logging, logging road network. And that gives me an opportunity just to say that a lot of the caribou and wolverine conservation work are uh, useful to, to do in tandem. We would see their tracks together um, um, fairly often. Um, and in fact, conservation solutions that are looking at both of them is something that uh, is, is important to, to be, to be uh, furthering today. Um, and also an interesting story about this, and this is the same map, the same survey, but these are wolves. And instead of just dots as to where they occur, it's pack size. And here you see that where you've got the proliferation of logging roads and, and, and uh, higher prey associated with this, so moose and deer are very abundant in these areas, the wolf packs become very large. Largest recorded wolf pack, 21 animals, which is unheard of in the far north where Food is much harder to come by. The wolf packs don't reach more than four or four individuals. Um, but here, this is a factor for wolverines because wolves both um, generate carcasses, but they eat them all when they have 21 animals. But they're also a predator of wolverines, particularly during denning. And so this can help also potentially explain uh, uh, what's going on with the, the distribution of wolverines, what is limiting them to the south. And in fact, the other part of the story, which I alluded to before, is trapping. This area of Red Lake and Air Falls has got quite a vibrant trapping community. Looking, uh, the targets are Lynx, Martin, et cetera. And those are all trap lines, those boundaries. And the, the beige is where there have been wolverine incidental harvests. So for the most part, these trappers are not interested in, in wolverines. They're not allowed to uh, target them, but they get them. Uh, accidentally in, in snares um, and, and leg hole traps for, for lynx. And so this is a, an issue that is one of the, the more difficult ones. Very quickly, because I'm running out of time here, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, interviews that I conducted in the far north. This is a very rich story, um, going, um, going and, and talking to about 130 people in six communities. Uh, to really sit down, look at maps, uh, understand the broader experience from an individual basis, and give you a collective knowledge of uh, Wolverine and the cultural relationship with people. Um, and I already showed you the communities that I went to in the stars. But Wolverines do figure very prominently in legends. 
And again, you can see the seeds of how the present day notion of the Marvel character, where that emerged from. And uh, this is a picture of uh, one that's been created by uh, somebody from uh, Kuchiching First Nation up north. And there's a long history of, of trapping uh, wolverines uh, in, in the north. But nevertheless, there isn't, uh, it was very useful to be able to get uh, a, 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 a good understanding about indigenous knowledge, other aspects of legends. I recorded a number of legends and, and, un, and understand and get a fuller appreciation of the human experience vis-a-vis -vis this animal, which doesn't live anywhere close to most of us. But this issue of incidental harvest, and these are uh, trap lines where over the last uh, 15 years or so, that wolverines have been accidentally harvested, and some of them are outside of the range. And remember, I told you about some of those wanderers. But up there, near the Red Lake area, is where you've got most number of incidental harvests, where there's a lot of concomitant trapping activity and very strong wolverine distribution. This has been the highlight of and the focus of a lot of our conservation work is to try to work with the trapper community to figure out means of uh, uh, having less uh, incidental harvest. It's been, a, it's been a really tough project. So we've got two issues with wolverine. We've got the fact that w uh, these are uh, sets, uh, traditional sets made out of wooden cubbies. And wolverine, this is one wolverine that went down a trap line after the bait and basically knocked each one down. So the trappers are already pissed off. And then they have to deal with the fact that the wolverine is getting into their link snares, which they didn't want them anyway. So there, these are really huge issues which are in a local, local, at a local scale um, are quite difficult to deal with, but they have um, repercussions for the larger scale conservation issues. And in fact, if, uh, we did a large survey this year where over 300 trappers participated from across uh, this, uh, northern Ontario, and that's all these um, white outline trapping units. And again, the problem is very focused on, the, on one area. This is a really good tool for us to understand how widespread it is. Because the trapper community is convinced that wolverines are proliferating across the country because of this, or across the province, because of this one set of experiences in this one geography. And this has allowed us to really focus there and focus our, our strategies. Um, from this, we've uh, had quite a lot of policy engagement um, and and a lot of this has been in three sort of particular areas. One has been in the form of uh, understanding how to survey and monitor these animals. There's really been no tradition before. To be able to train people for the, uh, to see and identify the tracks, but also to come up with a methodology, a quantitative methodology at various scales for understanding and being able to monitor their populations in the future. This has been an enormous uh, area of focus for us. But we've also been, um, we're quite engaged in the construction of the recovery strategy because this is a species at risk. And so this has been another area where we've made uh, significant contributions based on this study. And then finally, quite a bit of outreach, ranging from trapper education um, to kids, this is Earth Rangers up there, to actually coming up with management practices for the trapper community, et cetera. So these are hands-on things that we, um, as biologists con uh, con concocting this study, have uh, been spending most of their time on. And, uh, and I want to just then end with saying, well, who is we? He, uh, we is WCS Canada, Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. And this is an example of the kind of project that we do where PhD-level wildlife scientists who work in the field in these various sites across Canada, which we've chosen for various reasons. We've been there for the long term. This is, uh, uh, we, we work on species that range from otters to uh, wolverine to caribou to bison to bats to seals. And these, uh, we use these animals as a means for understanding both the threats that are um, uh, predominating in the areas that we care about, but also to be able to actually come up with solutions for the conservation dilemmas of the day. And this is the kind of um, work that we do, and so I hope that you enjoyed that as an example. And I'll end with just a little bit of a plug so to look at our website to learn more. And I'm happy to talk with any of you after coffee. And I don't know if we have any time for questions because I went a bit over. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll try to repeat them afterwards. Yeah.
How intelligent is the Wolverine compared to other animals? So the question was how intelligent, and of course I have to ask, well, what do you mean by intelligent? I, I think they're brilliant. Because uh, I don't know anyone who could, who could uh, live that lifestyle. <laughs> it is uh, very difficult. They, they have to cache their food and find it. They have to make a living in very harsh conditions by themselves. Um, and, uh, they, uh, and that is at the base of, an, of the legends that I've heard and the in fascinating experiences uh, that, came, that I've heard from trappers, um, examples of things that Wolverine, were, how Wolverine were able to outwit them again and again, to their frustration. But at the base of all these stories was this underlying admiration. And that gives me an opportunity to, to say that, you know, that, the, that card at the beginning that I showed is only part of the story because, you know, that's just, that's just capitalizing on all the bad attributes, but, and maybe they're inconvenient for us and perhaps even life-threatening at times. But, but uh, underlying that is this extraordinary ad uh, admiration that I've developed for these animals, and it must be about their intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, so this question was about climate change, and I skipped that, uh, talking about that very overtly because it could have been a, a, a lecture in and of itself. I mean, the two uh, things that fa this animal faces in the future are industrial development in the north plus climate change, and it's very much tied to that story I was telling about the spring, the persistence of spring snow. And uh, there are deep concerns that that is something that would cause the range to recede above and beyond any kind of uh, impacts that we, direct impacts that we have. That is a hypothesis. I mean, there's not very much direct evidence for that. Um, and there, and so, and a lot of it's based on our modeling so far, which is, you know, less than perfect. But it is certainly a, something to keep an eye on. You had a question, yeah. How many species, uh, uranium, how many species, lots of weasel families Okay. So I think there are three things there. The first one is um, how many species there are. There's only one species of wolverine, um, and you know there have been many attempts to put subspecies names on them, depending on where they are. But but that's all been amalgamated into one into one species. And uh, they live in the weasel family. And I don't remember how many there are, but we're talking about badgers, yeah, uh, otters, etc. Oh well, that's the mustelids. Uh, you know, Viveris from Africa. Uh, it's that they're a carnivore, right? So, you know, cats, dogs, bears, that kind of thing. Um, and then you asked about how long they stay with their mom, about a year. And uh, and the dad, you know, he's not a mother. <laughs> well, you know, it's a different guy, I think. <laughs> yes? So how do you educate a trapper that just lost his entire this is the most formidable threat challenge which I've been working on personally for six, seven years. And, I, and it's not about educating them, it's about coming up with a solution together um, and, and then trying to, uh, what I found is like coming in and saying, well, you know, it's not because the whole, there's more of the doesn't actually work uh, because it's everybody's self-perception that uh, you know, and, 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 and they've obviously been hurt by it. But what, I, what we've done with a bit of success recently is, is team up with trappers to think about solutions for just trap design. So uh, something, for example, that will hold a lynx but will let go of a wolverine. And, uh, and what is, it's been interesting to work with individuals who are really keen to find a solution and, uh, and, and actually spend some effort on it instead of complaining about it a great deal. It's been difficult because that's been kind of something we've had to be doing in WCS Canada on our own with the trappers. Uh, there's been really very little provincial interest in getting into this, um, and that's been the frustrating aspect of it. Yes. Just a question up there. Oh, sorry. You, you, you should there. do that. Watch yeah. possibility. Oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Is there much evidence of 
that, or are they clearly separated? That's a really good question. Um, so that it mostly happens in southern Ontario, and I get in my inbox many messages over the course of a year that say, oh, I saw Wolverine in Algonquin, and here it is, and, or I saw Wolverine, I got one in Hyde Park, and it was a raccoon. I was up there. Um, Wolverines, I, I was going to actually show today, Wolverines look remarkably like Fisher, actually. Like when you see a Fisher go up a tree, Wolverines can climb trees as well. And they just look like a bigger version of it. And if you don't see the, the, the pattern, um, then the, if there is no pattern visible, then you could easily uh, mix up a Wolverine and a Fisher. You could mix up a Wolverine track. A male grizzled Fisher looks a lot like a small Wolverine, and you could easily mix up the tracks. Bear, not so much. That doesn't seem to occur. But we get quite a lot of sightings, um, reports of sightings of Wolverine, particularly in southern Ontario, which when we verify them, they're mostly fishers, or almost entirely fishers, or raccoons. That's been the most common. But well, usually we can't verify them. Go ahead. Um, have, have, have any Wolverines ever been domesticated? And do they, any of them live in the zoo? Yes, they do. Actually, uh, some of you may have seen this. There was, and there might still be, a pair in the Skoka Wildlife Center. Um, they're, they're wonderful, but I think they closed them down for viewing, so I'm not sure if the Wolverines are still there. They're now doing entirely education, they're not visitors. There are definitely happy Wolverines for zoos, it's not common. There's, a, there's, also, uh, there's also a breeder in, in Idaho that has, also, has worked a lot with the, with the conservation community on methodology. So for example, one of my colleagues has spent days and days in there with the Wolverine to figure out how to set up a camera so that you can see the chest, because the chest actually has very unique identification. So if you set up a camera in such a fashion that they're showing their chest, then you can actually um, get numbers of individuals and, and figure out whether there's, and so it's very, you can figure out whether this individual, if you've got Bob or Frank, you know, um, and, and that way you can build a density estimate if you do it properly. Oh. I think kids have been raised, but not much further than that. I'm not actually sure about that. Yes? Uh, well, you mostly focus on North America, but you also mentioned Scandinavia. So are they doing anything differently about conserving the whole region oh, yeah. in Scandinavia? Can oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> That's a big question. I mean, so they've, they've had a long history of research in Sweden, um, and uh, the interesting thing there is that, uh, this is really complicated, the, uh, in Sweden they have semi-domesticated, the reindeer are semi-domesticated and they've got herders, and uh, they're, they're also, though those guys are a little smaller than the caribou we have. So Wolverine actually pre prey on those, carib on those reindeer quite a bit. And, and they've got sheep in Norway, and wolverines like them too. And so a lot of it is about, about the management is oriented towards livestock uh, predation. I mean, there's a lot more people there in Europe. And so the, and, but, and the interesting thing too is that uh, Scan, uh, Sweden and Norway have completely different means of compensation. So in Sweden, they actually compensate for the dens, whereas in Norway, they compensate for, for, they compensate people for having dens and maintaining them on their land, whereas in Norway they compensate people for having, uh, for killing wolverines that have killed their sheep. So, you know, a little bit different. Back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's the connection between wolverines and Bigfoot, and how many Bigfoot stories do you collect? <laughs> I didn't play too many of them. I didn't. I don't discern a relationship. <laughs> uh, more likely to have uh, the Phantom of the North is an outline these days, right? You know, that's that's the one you hear more about. Oh, okay. Yeah, but not Bigfoot. Yes. Yeah. Once you catch a Wolverine in your big log trap, yeah. Uh, how do you get around? <laughs> you gotta poke him. You gotta poke him with sediment. Sed sedative. And you do so, yes, exactly, yes, <clears throat> quickly, yes. There was a uh, documentary on TV a couple years ago, and uh, about a photographer who was by himself up 
in, in Alberta, I think. Well, there's your answer. They played together. It was quite remarkable. Because I, like you alluded to earlier, thought that the Wolverine was, uh, would have never adopt a relationship with a human. But in this case, it certainly did. And I don't know, I should maybe get the. Uh, well, but, yeah, but I was thinking of it in terms of bringing it into your home like a puppy. Uh, I think in that case. Well, that would be that would probably be rare, but yeah. I'm wondering if there are any other tales of trappers. Oh, I, I would imagine, yes. I would imagine. You get to know some of these personalities, right? Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, there's somebody back there.